Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to this evening's event when we're going to hear from photographer Nikki Gorick, who is going to explore the unique interaction between faith and commerce in the city of London. I'm Peter Murray. I'm chairman of the Temple Bar Trust. And before we get on to the main business of the evening, I'll just introduce to those who haven't uh, been to one of these before, uh, give you some uh, introduction to the sort of thing that we're going to be doing in Temple Bar in the future. We will shortly be signing our lease to take on uh, Christopher Wren's arch uh, that is now located in Paternoster Square and the adjacent Paternoster Lodge, which will become not just the, the home of the Westworld Company of Chartered Architects, but will be an education centre where we will be uh, introducing people to the architecture of the Square Mile, uh, to uh, architectural careers for schools in the surrounding area of the city, and also uh, introducing the, the sort of way the city works and the way the planning planning in the city works uh, to uh, the local community. So interesting series of, of events. And we have, over the last couple of years, been doing virtual events like this one, really, as a sort of lead in to what we hope will now be undisturbed physical events in the future, which will take place in Temple Bar and in Paternoster Pater Lodge itself. Uh, so uh, we will let everyone know as soon as we've got the key to the door at Temple Bar, and we look forward to organising a busy programme there. But uh, today uh, we are still online, and uh, we're going to, as I say, be hearing from Nikki Gorick, who's... Uh, uh, has uh, done a, this excellent book on uh, faith and city, but also is now working on a new book, uh, which is called Dock Life Renewed, looking at St. Catherine's Docks, Surrey Docks and the Isle of Dogs uh, to see how these, these old dock areas have been transformed into busy and diverse communities in, in, uh, over the last 40 years or so. So if there's anyone out there, uh, architects or developers who have been involved in the uh, uh, development of, of the docks and the sort of changing face of the docks over that period who might be interested in uh, supporting the book do uh, get in touch. So now on to this evening's uh, talk and uh, there are some uh, 40 Anglican churches and Jewish, Dutch, Catholic and Welsh places of worship squeezed into the square mile and faith in the city um, which is available um, online or at all good bookshops. Uh, Amazon have it on sale. Uh, you can uh, get it there. But uh, for an introduction, uh, we're going to ask Nikki to talk about the book, uh, looking at the sort of vibrant, diverse spiritual life within London's financial centre. So Nikki, over to you. Thank you, thank you very much, Peter. Thank you. Um, good evening. And uh, thank you for joining us. Um, right. Well, faith and money making. Uh, not two areas of human interest you would normally put together. But in London Square Mile, remarkably, they do coexist. You're looking at um, a photograph which shows how over 400 clerics filled Paternoster Square, where London, London Stock Exchange happens to be, um, for the then Bishop of London, Richard Charteris's farewell celebrations back in 2017. The photo also rather fortuitously shows Temple Bar in all its glory. Um, so this very grand send off for the bishop um, took place in St Paul's Cathedral um, and it sort of fits with the very high ceremonial types of events we're all used to seeing on television. But for the book, I, I was much more curious to, to find out what, what, if anything, was going on in the other over 40 churches and places of worship within the geographical confines of the square mile. Here is one of them. This is St Catherine Cree. As you can see, surrounded by towers of commerce, the, the gherkin and the uh, cheese grater. Um, I wondered if these churches were still functioning or whether they were just ancient buildings uh, visited by tourists. I was interested to discover if there is a spiritual life within one of the most uh, financially driven parts of the world. And after over 200 visits to most of the City of London places of worship, I can say that there definitely is and that the spiritual life is full of contrast, diversity, and surprises. For example, here is another one. This is uh, St. Ethelburgers on Bishopsgate. Again, it's also dwarfed by office buildings. 
just to give you some history, uh, remarkably, this medieval church was one of the, the very few city churches that survived both the Great Fire and the Blitz. But in 1993, an IRA bomb blew 70% of it to bits. But thanks to a campaign made by the Bishop of London, it was reconfigured, it was rebuilt, and it was reopened in 2003 as a centre of reconciliation and peace. And it welcomes people of all faiths. For example, uh, because there is no Gurdwara temple within the square mile, the Sikh business community um, find the space they need to hold weekday prayers inside St. Ethelberger's very large, rather beautiful Bedouin tent, which sits in their garden space. So diversity of belief and culture are very much part of this, cult this center's ethos. And on another visit, this time to the church's uh, reconstructed nave, I was able to capture a wonderful evening of Afghan music and a little bit of impromptu dancing, as you can see here. So this is not what you would necessarily expect to find in a church founded in the 13th century. So I would say that diversity um, and surprises are the defining qualities I discovered during the four years of photographing for the book. Now, this may be a rather extreme example of such surprising diversity, but here is something I certainly wasn't expecting to come across at a church service. This magnificent wet fish display is laid out every October by Billingsgate fish merchants at St. Mary at Hill Church. Old Billingsgate fish market stands just down the hill from the church. And although the working fish market moved east to Poplar in 1982, uh, the fishmongers still come back here to celebrate this history as well as to raise money for charity. This beautiful display is all sold off um, after the service. So I discovered that these religious festivals and traditions are still very much part of life in the square mile. For example, I had no idea that you would find donkeys processing through city streets on Palm Sunday. Uh, here they are getting a liberal sprinkling of holy water outside St. Vidast alias Foster. Uh, they're on their way from a service at St. Giles Cripplegate near the Barbican uh, to meet up with the Bishop of London on the steps of St. Paul's Cathedral to receive a special blessing. This is the beginning of Easter week. It's a very busy week for all Christian places of worship, and it's certainly full of drama. Here is the first fire of Easter being lit in the cloister of St. Bartholomew the Great, which is supposed to be the oldest parish church in all of London. St. Bart's was founded as a priory uh, in the 12th century, and unusually, it celebrates the resurrection of Christ on the evening of Holy Saturday, rather than the better known time of early on Easter Sunday morning. And it was, a, it was wonderful to photograph this as the whole church was in darkness until this magnificent brazier was lit and the Paschal candle was carried through into the main church. And despite appearances, this priest did not set fire to himself and he did continue with the service. Elsewhere at Easter, a circle of light is created at the Dutch church to celebrate the resurrection. The Dutch had been worshipping here in the narrow streets of Austin Friars for over 400 years, ever since Edward VI, the son of Henry VIII, gave persecuted refugees from the Netherlands a church building to practice in as reformed Calvinists. The current church on the site dates from the 1950s, as the previous one was bombed during World War II, but it's still very much the focus for Britain's Dutch community today. And not to be outdone, over at St Bride's Church, after their own Easter service at dawn, the whole congregation is outside on Fleet Street by 7.15am, ready for another great Easter tradition of egg rolling down this famous thoroughfare. Here you can see the Reverend Canon Dr Alison Joyce, who's leading the competition to roll the furthest, whilst of course trying to miss the everyday obstacles of London buses and taxis. But it's not all about Protestantism. To mark Good Friday and the Way of the Cross, another procession sets off, this time from St Mary Moorfields, which is the city's only Roman Catholic church. It's uh, located up near Liverpool Street. Here, this in impressive lineup, even on a rather grey and chilly morning, was passing through the Barbican to make a complete circuit of the city, stopping at various points for prayer. Roman Catholic uh, 
worship was in fact once illegal and had to be secretly practiced in small chapels. But it now thrives at the busy St. Mary Moore Fields. Here you can see Father Chris Vipers preparing the Eucharist at Friday Mass. The church caters to mainly non-resident city workers who visit from their offices, often attending daily. If you're looking for the Jewish religion within the city, you'll find that it's been well, well represented here for over 300 years. And it's still going strong at Bevis Marks Synagogue, which is the only synagogue within the geographical confines of the square mile. Here you can see the rabbi leading a blessing before the ark that's open and revealing the Torah scrolls. And it's taking place during a wedding, a particular tradition at this uh, beautiful ancient synagogue to give this blessing. Bevis Marks continues to host major ceremonial services for Anglo Jewry, as well as many family celebrations such as this. In contrast, Romanians of the Christian Orthodox faith were relative newcomers to the city, and they had no dedicated place to worship. So 50 years ago, they started to share the Anglican Church of St Dunstan in the West on Ludgate Hill near St Paul's. Uh, like many churches, it, it just wasn't being used on a Sunday because there were very few residents within the square mile. So St Dunstan's became the spiritual home for all of London's Romanian community, with over 400 people attending Sunday services lasting all morning. Very family focused from grandmothers to babies, um, and they centred on a magnificent, richly carved altar that you can see there, that they managed to transfer piece by piece from a Romanian monastery and install at St Dunstan's in 1966. They have, in fact, temporarily moved to worship um, outside the city um, at St Mary Le Strand Church, uh, but they're looking forward to returning to St Dunstan's after its refurbishment. Now, there's no mosque within the square mile, so you might well ask, where do Muslims go for Friday prayers? And the answer is that they hire rooms such, in places such as here at the Worshipful Company of Wax Chandler's Livery, Livery Hall. Before the pandemic, workers from offices nearby would stream in to fill two floors of these very grand state rooms, very, uh, just uh, along from Guildhall. Prayer mats were carefully laid out, the imam was mic'd up so that everyone could hear him. You can just see him in white in the top right-hand corner. And a couple of hundred worshippers came and prayed every Friday lunchtime. For this, I was up with the ladies on the balcony, so I got a particularly good view. I'm not sure what the rather austere-looking 18th century gentleman in the painting would have thought of all this. I also discovered a very modern side of worship to worship in the city. This is the chapel within the high-tech international headquarters of the Salvation Army. It's just by the Millennium Bridge. It was opened in 2004 and was designed by the architect Andrew Chadwick. Uh, the Salvation Army have in fact owned this site ever since it was given to them in 1881. And uh, here you can see the staff are holding morning prayers in a, in a chapel beautifully filled with light reflected in through a sky wall of glass panels. Now you might well ask, why would the Salvation Army be wasting money on building and maintaining a headquarters right in the expensive center of London? But with representatives in over 130 countries, they felt that it was important to maintain a central presence in Britain's capital. And for this new build, they cleverly sold a 150 year lease on the commercial property constructed on the rest of the site. And this meant that they got a fantastic new headquarters at almost no cost to themselves. It's a stunning building uh, if you haven't been and it's well worth visiting for its excellent cafe. So these places of worship are certainly not boring. And uh, I found that it's usually driven uh, by the clergy working within them as they are generally very outgoing, very good gregarious characters with a well-tuned gift for communication. And this was certainly uh, the case with the very busy Reverend Canon David Parrott when he was Guild Vicar at St Lawrence Jury, the official church of the Lord Mayor and the City of London Corporation right by Guild, Guild Hall itself. Uh, the church also, of course, has close links with the Chartered Architect, so many of you will know it well. Before David retired in October 2021, he usually officiated during December on, at, on average, three carol services a day. I think the record was five. And there was certainly no 
recycling of sermons. The four that I heard were all clever, funny and thought provoking. And as you can see for this one, he um, donned a sweatband. I think it was to illustrate a link between his experience of trying to keep fit and being a Christian. There are also uh, many more women rising through the ranks. The pioneer was Reverend Catherine Rumans, who was rector at St. Giles Cripplegate at the Barbican uh, from the year 2000. She was the first woman to be uh, appointed to such a position within the city. Do please note her beautiful bangles and bracelets. She uh, is an ex art teacher and fashion designer. And she certainly brought a very distinctive artistic elegance to her popular ministry. She also retired in 2021 um, after 20 years in the job, and I'm sure she'll be much missed. However, other ladies have uh, followed her into the city. Um, another very prominent one being Reverend Rose Hudson Wilkin, who has now moved on to become Bishop of, of Dover. But I was lucky enough to uh, photograph her during her time at priest in charge of St. Mary at Hill. At this time, she was also juggling the demands of being chaplain to both the Queen and the Speaker of the House of Commons. But as many of you might know, it is traditional for every city livery company to also appoint their own chaplain. And one lunchtime, Reverend Rose invited me to record her installation into yet another chaplaincy this time for the Worshipful Company of Water Conservators. This took place at Trinity House, the beautiful headquarters of the General Lighthouse Authority. And I really enjoyed capturing how she brought not only serious support, but also a, a great deal of um, humour and uh, to her third chaplaincy role. As you can probably gather, she's a, a truly warm and very impressive character. The younger generation of vicars are also coming up fast, including Reverend Laura Jorgensen, who has been rector at St. Botolf without Aldgate since 2009. She's fostered a very family friendly ethos within her church, not least by giving birth herself. As the then Bishop of London, Richard Charters, put it very amusingly at her son's christening, for the first time in over nine centuries, the rector has had a baby. So I certainly noticed that all the clerics do seem to build up a great rapport with their congregations. Here you can see Reverend Bertrand Olivier celebrating his 10 year anniversary at All Hallows by the Tower with a service packed with well wishes, followed by a party complete with a cake and this wonderfully theatrical gesture for the cameras. Bertrand has now moved to Canada to be Dean and Rector of Montreal's Christ Church Anglican Cathedral. However, I also discovered that it's not only vicars who wield sharp objects in the city churches. In a service of investiture, a ceremonial sword is used to welcome a new recruit into the Grand Priory of Knights Templar at St. Stephen Walbrook Church. Despite putting on a great show by wearing their very distinctive cloaks and other regalia, these modern day knights actively follow the serious tenets of Christianity, chivalry and charity and they do promote and fund a lot of good causes. Ceremonial robes of all types are, are certainly very much part of everyday life in the city churches, particularly here in St. Stephen Walbrook, as it is the parish church for Mansion House next door, and so has close ties to the Lord Mayor of London. Here are a couple of high sheriffs uh, socialising there um, after a service. In the foreground, you can see Dr. Christine Rigdon, and in the background, you've got Sir Charles Bowman, who became Lord Mayor two years after this photograph was taken. They're certainly both looking very resplendent in their full formal robes. Now, this may well be familiar territory to some of you, as you will all know that the city's 110 livery companies, both ancient and modern, all have links with, with the city churches and every one of them has a set of different ceremonial robes. So there's a lot of dressing up to maintain traditions. For example, here you're looking at the Worshipful Company of Painter Stainers. They are one of um, three livery companies that continues the ancient custom of processing to church on their patron saint's day in full gown and coats, sorry, full gown and hats rather, and with the added flourish of carrying poses. On every St. Luke's Day since 1683, they have attended St. James Garlic Hive for a festival service led by their beadle, master and wardens. 
Now, robed up members of livery companies in city churches may seem perfectly normal to those of us who know the square mile quite well, uh, but they do surprise many visitors and really are one of the defining and wonderfully colourful aspects of these places of worship. However, livery companies do have some competition as military links and uniforms are also much in evidence. Uh, particularly on Remembrance Day, which is strongly marked within the city in many of its churches. And so Catherine Cree, the Lloyd's Insurance Branch of the Royal British Legion, brings together young and old for a very moving service. Later in the year, towards Christmas, the Royal Marines hold their annual carol service at St Lawrence Jewry, where their regimental colours, that you can see here, and then their renowned buglers create a unique atmosphere. It's really quite something to hear these sound out at the end of the service. Now, this brings us to a very important part of what goes on in the city churches, which is an amazing amount of music of all kinds played and sung to an incredibly high standard. And it's not always of the type you might expect. Here on St. James's Day at St. Catherine Cree, a jazz band leads the congregation, including the highly accomplished choir from Lloyd's Insurance, out of the church into the garden for a celebration supper of jerk chicken. It added a wonderful flourish to the end of the service, and you've guessed it very appropriately, they were playing Oh When the Saints Go Marching In. Choirs, uh, of course, are to be expected. But not every church can boast a top class choral group like the Temple Choir that is renowned for not only producing sublime singing within the magnificent acoustics of Temple Church itself, but also for tackling and recording new works and for touring the world. There is choral abundance of both large and small groups in most of the city churches. In this case, you're looking at the 30 strong English Chamber Choir who rehearse and perform in St Andrew by the Wardrobe. Now that things are getting back to normal, um, many of these choirs can be heard again for free during lunchtime performances and at services, and they're well worth checking out. It's also worth checking out is the Barbican Arts Centre's Sound Unbound Festival, which uh, was staged every May for many years, and hopefully it will return. Um, and St what happened was St Giles Cripplegate became a venue for such uh, contrasting musical styles as the 12 ensemble, playing Mendelssohn here with a tremendous flourish, um, in contrast to a Belgian electronic band called Zwerm performing their interpretation of Tudor music. It was very well re received. However, to highlight two of the city's more traditional music musical activities, one of the great privileges of doing this project was being able to go behind the scenes who wouldn't leap at the opportunity of climbing up uh, the bell tower of St Mary Le Beau to photograph one of the regular bell ringing practices by the ancient society of college youths, as they call themselves. The Beau Bells are of course world famous and very much part of uh, the city's folklore from confirming a true cockney to the well-known Lord Mayor Dick Whittington. But with 12 bells in total, method ringing here is a real test of memory and concentration. And it was fascinating to see a mix of old and young still ringing out history. Over at St Lawrence Jewry, I had to do a little less climbing to reach its organ loft, where I was able to photograph this church's then director of music, Catherine Ennis. She was conducting one of her renowned masterclasses. This photograph was taken in 2016. Very sadly, Catherine passed away in December 2020. She was a former president of the Royal College of Organists and was much sought after as an enthusiastic and inspiring teacher. For me, it was a morning of real insight into the incredibly high levels of expertise needed to play these complex instruments that are so integral to city, sorry, to church life. Now, one of the many things I hadn't realized was just how long faith has been around in the city of London. Seven meters below its modern European headquarters Bloomberg has reconstructed the remains of the Temple of Mithras. It's open again and you can now go and visit for free. And it's well worth going as it's a wonderfully immersive experience of pagan worship in Roman London from almost 2000 years ago. Uh, and they recreate it with a mix of light and sound. Back then, members of this mysterious cult of Mithras, often soldiers, 
met in private, dark and windowless spaces, um, focusing on the mythological scene of this god, Mithras, killing a bull in a cave. Roman history is brought to life in a very different way over at All Hallows by the Tower Church. Here we are in its crypt, another dark and windowless space, but this time the centurion is an actor who is dramatically conjuring up life in Roman Britain for a class of schoolchildren. Clio's company specializes in interactive drama projects for schools and hires the church to cleverly structure history days that involve costumed action that you see here. And then in the afternoon, the same actors in Mufti create workshops in which children are encouraged to resolve historical questions for themselves, which as you can see, they do rather enthusiastically. So such paying guests are very useful for all the city churches as the cost of their upkeep is not met by central funding or by service collections. All sorts of groups and activities can be found making very good use of these spaces and adding to the coffers. Here, Amanda Corsi takes city workers through their moves at her weekly yoga class within the beauty and calm of St. Anne and St. Agnes. This particular church is still designated as a chapel uh, of ease uh, to um, St. Vidast alias Foster Church nearby. And a few services are held here each year, but the church is now essentially run and maintained by Voces 8 Foundation, which is a very busy music and education charity. Over at uh, St. Andrew by the Wardrobe, this very aptly named church was for a time home to the amazing Suited and Booted. This is a charity that transforms young men's lives by preparing them for interviews. And the church's large upper balconies uh, made a perfect storage and working area for them. The charity's volunteers uh, take young men, referred to them by public agencies, and they help kit them out in a good suit and all the right accessories, advice, interview training and other support follow and they have a very high success rate. Suited and booted uh, can now be found uh, near London Wall and they are very well worth supporting. As the oldest part of London, the Square Mile has a great deal of unique history. And I found that anniversaries and tradition from this complex past are still very much celebrated by the city churches. And this creates a surprising mix of annual and one-off events. Beating of the Bounds uh, is one example, which you're looking at here. All Hallows by the Church continues this medieval custom of reaffirming its parish boundaries every year on Ascension Day in May, with a procession of city and livery representatives and the enthusiastic help of students from the once local St Dunstan's College. A particularly tricky aspect is the fact that the southern parish uh, boundary lies midstream in the River Thames. And this does, does require some rather creative waterborne marking. To mark a very different point in history, every August, the same church, All Hallows, commemorates the World War II siege of and defense of, of Malta. Colors are laid on the altar, which you can see there, during a service attended by veterans and families from the George Cross Island Association. The island of Malta was collectively awarded the George Cross by King George VI in 1942. And a memorial was built close to the church in 2005 with a stone presented by the Maltese government on the 60th anniversary of the end of the Second World War. Here, wreaths are annually laid for the 7,000 civilian and military lives that were lost. And this moving commemoration is a reminder uh, of the position held by the city at the heart of the whole British Commonwealth. Focusing closer to home, the Butterworth Charity Service at St. Bartholomew the Great continues the long tradition of city churches giving money to the local poor. Here on Good Friday, a widow of the parish claims her coin, there she is holding it up in her hand, from Reverend Marcus Walker. In the old days, up to 21 widows could claim in this way, not so many now. But the service is still a strong reminder of charitable responsibility. And as part of the original bequest, free hot cross buns are given to all those attending and are a very popular draw. All the clergy in the city know full well that they need to connect 
with the financial community around them in order to thrive. And it's not an easy task in the fast moving work focused world of the square mile. Here we have two reverends on Remembrance Day and they're on their way to lead short services actually inside offices. It's an important opportunity to bring the practice of faith right into the centers of commerce. Within the city churches themselves, links with the commercial side of the square mile can be particularly well fostered when a member of the clergy is able to draw on good connections from a previous life working in business. Here is the Reverend Sally Muggeridge at St. Stephen Walbrook, hosting an evening celebrating the contribution of women to city business with her great, sorry, with her guest business leader, Glenn Marino. This involved a very lively discussion. If you're looking at the size of congregations, the evangelical wing of the Anglican Christian Church has perhaps been the most successful in attracting followers in the square mile. Their um, Sunday services at um, St. Helen's Bishop's Gate are the best attended in the city, as you can see here. With its focus on close study of the Bible, the church attracts a large following of all age groups, but uh, particularly students and young office workers who also flock to its absorbing midweek discussion groups, uh, which become very enthusiastic. St. Helens has certainly become a hub for other city churches following its evangelical form of Christian worship. The truly practical faith, it's the city pastors who win out. They have been putting the Samaritan spirit into action on the late night streets of the square mile since 2017. They're led by Tony Thomas, who you can see here, who is the chaplain of, uh, to the City of London Police. And uh, this trained group of church volunteers patrol the city streets, talking and listening to people and offering care and support to those at risk or in need. And this can range from bottles of water to philosophical discussions. This, was, uh, this photograph was taken on a hot summer Friday night in 2019, when the streets were very busy with revelers. And it was very interesting and, and quite surprising to witness just how open people were to what the city pastors had to offer. So to finish, just a couple of photographs to personify the fascinating contrasts and diversity of faiths and people that I kept finding when I was photographing for this book. I captured this surprise pairing at an art show given in the gentleman on the right's honor inside the gentleman on the left's international headquarters. I'm sure you can tell them apart, but they are the Salvation Army's General, Brian Pevel, who is the spiritual leader to one million Salvationists worldwide, and his eminence Archbishop Gregorius of Theateria and Great Britain. Uh, they had very contrasting styles, but certainly seemed to get on famously. And here you have two senior representatives of the Christian faith. The first woman, Anglican Bishop of London, Sarah Mullally, chatting with his eminence Archbishop Angelos, who is the Coptic Orthodox Archbishop of London. They are indulging in a bit of ecumenical dialogue at her St Paul's Cathedral installation service in May 2018. They certainly made a wonderful contrast at this very grand event. But as I hope this talk has revealed, these well-known types of ceremonial events at St Paul's are just the tip of a very large faith-based faith iceberg in the city, and there is a lot more to discover. So I've only shown you 64 photographs today, which is just a taster, as there are over 170 in the actual book. Uh, I do hope you can get hold of a copy, um, but um, thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you very much uh, for uh, a, a wonderful trip around the churches of, of London, the activities within them. And uh, I'd just say to everyone in the audience, do please put uh, any questions you have for Nikki in the uh, chat at the bottom of your screen, and uh, I'll put uh, the questions to her. But I, 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 was, I was interested to start off with this, to, uh, what, what drew you to uh, this as a subject? Is it your own religion? Is it an interest in the city, um, interest in architecture? What, what was it that uh, made this an interesting subject for you to pursue? I think it was the latter two. Um, I photograph all over London, but I've done a lot within the city. 
and um, doing some a- exhibitions there, I, I sort of got to know the city churches and I started to go into them. And that's when I started thinking, hmm, you know, uh, what actually go- goes on here? Um, and it was fascinating. So I was a sort of in- interested um, out- outsider, if that makes makes sense. So I, I, I went in without any axes to grind or you know, any um, particular view. And I just followed my my nose and found it fa- fascinating, definitely. And I mean, I, no- I noticed that there weren't uh, uh, a huge number of actual services, you might say. They're, probably they're not very interesting to, to photograph, uh, but um, uh, uh, maybe the you know the the evangelical service at St Helen's Bishopgate was a, was an exception to that. Uh, do you come away with feeling that the, the churches are uh, well used for religion, or are they places for yoga and uh, livery events and um, other things which are not necessarily what churches are traditionally about? Mm. Uh, that's a very good question. It really varies. Um... I think a lot of people get introduced into the churches through the livery companies. <clears throat> um, and I mean, they certainly are used, but some more than others. And they some do struggle. Um, and it will be interesting to see what happens, whether they have to con- consolidate. Um, but as with the Romanians, you know, other faiths use the um, um, churches, the, the, where they are predominantly ang- Anglican churches. Um, in the book, there are photographs of other um, services. So you you do get sort of um, special ev- events um, which bring people in, you know, um, obviously Easter, Christmas, that kind of thing. Um, but um, it's, I mean, long gone are the days when lots of people lived in the city and there was a church on every corner and they, and they were packed. I mean, that's, that's the problem. Not, not many people live in the city, although I know that that's beginning to change, perhaps. Uh, but so, the, but there is, um, I, I mean, it, it's not totally irreligious, the city. Uh, but I mean, I was fascinated to see, I had no idea that there was a, Coptic Orthodox Bishop of London. So yeah. it's fascinating to, to know that. And to a certain extent, the variety of faiths you showed, I guess, also re- reflect the, the, the global aspect of the City of London. I mean, it is a global business centre, isn't it? And it has historically always been a, 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 a trading uh, city, connections with many other countries and and, and and face and this reinforces that I suppose yes I mean there are certainly some faiths which aren't still represented I tried very hard to find um, some Buddhist worship Hindu worship but they do tend to you know do it just out, outside and um, as I say the 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 actual mosque I think the closest one is um, in um, just out outside um, in Brick, Brick Lane is probably the closest one. So um, uh, whether or not that will change, I don't know. But but they um, uh, those that do uh, want to serve, you know, help office workers who have a faith and want to go out for day, daily prayers, they do. They are able to use the Anglican churches, which is which is good, you know, which is as it should should be. But I suppose interesting that there is. Uh, as you said, only only one Roman Catholic church within uh, yeah. the city, which does also reflect a, a sort of historical element, I suppose, of the city of the, you know, the city of London had the drain band supporting Cromwell, and so there's sort of more, I may say, Puritan and um, non-Catholic element historically within the city, yeah. which maybe is reflected in that. Yeah, and that's one of the busier churches. I mean, I've, the photographs in the book showing. You know, there are, there are, it's very well ad- attended. I mean, obviously with COVID, it wasn't, but I think they were you know, coming coming back now. Um. Yes, and I, 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 I like the, uh, the the picture of the livery company processing uh, to their church on their patron saint's day, which is something um, the architects don't do. I mean, I, 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 we, we have uh-huh. actually just started um, having an event on our patron saint's day uh, but um, but but to have a procession to our church um 
is 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 something we haven't done yet but perhaps when we're in temple bar a procession from temple bar to the church might yeah. actually work work rather rather well although of course our our, our church st lawrence jury is going undergoing a massive amount of work at the moment so there's not much one can do inside it <laughs> true true but uh, but when it's all done and looking beautiful then yes yeah it's always fun to pro to process Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's one of one of the nice th things that happen in, in the city, which uh, surprises tourists and, and and indeed workers quite often as well in the, in in the city. Definitely, uh, definitely. So um, yeah, we're a bit short of questions tonight. Obviously, you've covered the topic so thoroughly. But okay. I, 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 final question is: what what, what is method ringing? Um, uh, oh God, very uh, complicated. Did you, uh, did you but, learn that while you uh, was? No, I mean. I think you have to be good at maths. I've decided they 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 had sort of strips, um, most extraordinary strips with dots on, a great big stream of dots, and somehow from that they knew when to pull their particular bell. I mean, extraordinary. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't begin to un to understand it, but um, it was uh, and it was great to see young you know, young people doing it, and it was a very 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 good mix and. Um, and uh, they ring bells in other churches as well, um, but that's their kind of chief, chief uh, place. Oh, well, the, the, the same people, they go from... I think so, yes. Trying yeah. out different, different bells. Yeah. That's interesting. Yes, yeah, very good. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, it's fascinating. So uh, thank you very much indeed for taking us it's through that. And, uh, say to people in the audience, but it, 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 it is available, as I say, in all, all good bookshops and uh, <laughs> even on Amazon if uh, you're... You're, yeah. you're not getting out these days and um uh, so uh, thanks for the great introduction i'm sure sales will um uh, benefit from uh, your uh, splendid introduction to the topic so nikki thank you very much indeed thank you for ha having me peter thank you okay bye-bye night. Night. night everyone night